So today's the grand tour. Is everybody able to open Photoshop? Does everybody know where to go? Depending on your computer and how it's set up, let me show you the easiest way. To, I won't say it's the easiest, but it's the most foolproof way. If you double click on the hard drive, this icon in the upper right hand corner, then select the folder. Um, actually, at the top here, I'd make sure that this little button is selected so you see these columns. If you don't, use them singly. This one is icons. I find icons kind of confusing. This is not. This it shows when you drill down, you know, folders within folders within folders. So that's what I think how things work. So I have the hard drive selected. Now I select applications and it shows all the applications inside the application folder. Next I want to go to Photoshop CS3. Within that is the application itself. So if I select this, you notice that another little window pops open and it tells you what kind of file this is. It's an application. <coughs> so for those PC users, that would be an exact file. And you still aren't logged in. You gotta remind them again, again, again. Now, if you're working on this at home and um, you wanted to have easy access to your applications, all you have to do is drag this icon and drag it down here into the dock and it puts an alias there so in the future you see I have mine right here and you just click on it and it launches Photoshop but because your computers are set up with um, deep freeze that's not going to happen so they might have a folder over here that says documents, it says applications, and you might find it in there. Put in mind, feature station is set up a little bit. When you open Photoshop, this is what it should look like. This is, these are the default settings for Photoshop. And because we don't have a file open, we only have our tools visible. Oops. Now, what you will see over to the left if I click on the little blue icon, I can drag the tools wherever I want. If I move it over, it locks it in place to the side. I want to make sure that all of you can see this. So I'm moving it over. This is really the core, uh, sort of the core of Photoshop. That these are a list of all of the tools. And we will cover these in detail. Going from the move tool to different kinds of selection tools and what their function is. There are more, so oh. there are more selection tools beneath that. And more selection tools beneath that. This is the crop tool for slicing up images for the internet, for web, that's what this is. We have tools that allow, will allow you to repair photographs, so this is the healing brush. There's a um, paint brush to actually paint with, so more traditional kinds of um, painting and drawing techniques. Clone stamp tool to copy areas, eraser tool, gradients. Um, these tools are taken from traditional Darkroom um, tools. One is a blur tool. Um, more specifically, down here you have Dodge Burn. Then we have something called the Sponge tool. Pen tool. These next series of tools are our um, vector based tools. Eyedropper to pick up color. Hand to move something. You know, move a photograph around. Zoom tool. We have our four, foreground and background color. So these are basic tools. <coughs> when you select any one of those tools, and I hope this doesn't crash. Looks like it's, no, there we go. You'll notice that as I select a tool, 
that the menu along the top changes. When I selected the type tool, you'll notice now, under type, by default, um, Myriad Roman 24 point is selected. And here, whatever fonts we have stored in our computer are available, and we can select from there. And you notice in our computers, we have quite a few. There are way, way more than what are available here, but we have a good selection to start with. Okay. You can also choose, when you choose the font, you can choose what particular style. And depending on the font you choose, one regular is chosen by default, but if you want a bold or semi-bold or italic typeface, that can be from here, and this determines the size. And you want sharp, crisp, or strong. You want the type to be justified left, centered, right. And what color do you want the type? And then there's some more tools over here. Later on, when we actually create some type, um, there are some effects that are available that I will demonstrate for you because they're pretty cool. We also, over here, we can toggle the character and paragraph palettes. These, in addition to these tools, give additional functionality to this tool. There's lots of, lots of controls available to control type, for example. This is something called the bridge. It is available no matter what tool you select. Notice that when I make a rectangular selection, um, this little menu at the top changes and it will indicate what options are available to, to make changes there. Do I want this to be um, a regular selection? Do I want it to subtract from another selection? Do I want to feather this selection? What style do I want? Do I want to add an anti-aliasing? Do I want to put in a specific size here? Do I want to redefine the edge? Most of these are grayed out because they don't have anything selected at the moment. But again, notice that there's this tool here, which is called Bridge, which we're going to come to it. Okay? So no matter what tool you select, typically this menu bar along the top of this dock, menu dock, will change. And it adds functionality to whatever tool you have here. In addition to the visible tools that you see here, you'll notice in the lower right hand corner, for some, of them, some of them, there's a little tick mark. You all see those. It's a little, looks like a dog here in the lower right hand corner. If you see that, then that means that there are additional variations of that tool underneath. could be selected from right here. If I go to a window, you notice now that it's selected, you can see that swatches is selected. But what if I want to see paths? What if I want to see paragraph options? If I want to see the color, when I select, you notice that it switches over. So any palettes that you may want to use, and again, add functionality to the tools <coughs> over here, not always, but in most cases, um, will be found over here. And you can close this like so. To add real estate, you can open it up. You can also click here. No, I can't. There we go. It's a little lag. To add here or close to close it. To, um, tighten it up. Okay. You can also pull this out like so with this left tab and drag it. We can do the same from here. We want to widen that and narrow it. It's this little button here. Okay. If I click here, that widens it. It closes it the same here. If I close this, that tightens it up. So depending on how much real estate you're willing to give up and how much you really need to see the, the tools that are available uh, will be determined how you want this. Now, in addition to that, I said that you could, if you don't want this over to the left, because that's the default position of the tools, 
you click on the little blue icon and you can drag and if you would rather have it on the right than on the right. If we click on the little tab here, notice that it changes it slightly into two columns instead of one. Why do they do that? Because that's the way Photoshop used to look. And then when they came out with CS3, in order to conserve on real estate, they made it a single column instead of two. So those people accustomed to older versions that would rather see it in two columns have this choice. And then if I want to move this over and sync it up with that, the left edge of my, my desktop. Okay. Now each of these palettes over here can be changed too. Notice that I can toggle back and forth between swatches and colors, but maybe I want to see both. Because my goal is to add some custom colors to my, my default swatches. But what I can do is I can click and drag and pull these off. So now they're separate. And I can also click on here and I can put them back in and it puts them back in. And I can click on here and I can click back in and here and it adds it. So they can, they're movable. You can do whatever you want with them. You're not in any way constrained by the order that you see. So again, if I want to see the swatches, I want to come over here and look at RGB color. And I come down here and I select the color in here. It's this kind of grayish blue. And I want to add this to my palette over here. And you'll notice the palette is a little restrictive. Just click and drag, you know, click on it. Okay, sorry, click again. Um, select here, add to add to swatches. I can do that from here, or I can come over here. Um, okay, I'll just click on it and do it this way. Add and then move it over. If I want to name the swatch, Kirk's Blue. I made a mistake. So I can come back and Double click on again. Oops. And when I roll over it, in a hole, you'll see the little yellow tag that opens up that says it's curved blue. If I don't want this anymore, with this one selected, I can also click on it and drag it into the trash can and it's gone. We can also save palettes, we can import palettes, we can do all sorts of stuff. So many bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. um, if we did this on the on two of the swatches, would it be safe once we shut down the machine? It should be. Uh, but if this is the default palette, so if I come in here and I select reset swatches, and I go okay. Save save changes to current swatches before replacing them. Don't save. Then it goes back, so it gives you options. And you can also come up here and you can not only reset, but we can save swatches. And you can save swatches for the exchange, which is something that's available on Adobe now. Replace swatches. Notice all the other color types that we have available. I mean, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. There's lots and lots of choices. Put that in there. Let's put this back in here. These can be moved up or down by clicking on the menu bar. I can also customize my palette, palettes in another way, organize them. For example, maybe I like to use brushes a lot. So I'm going to bring this over here, and I like to have it over here. I don't know why, I just do. Um, let's come over here, and I want my history palette to be available. And so I'm going to move that over here so that it's disconnected. Just as a matter of example, I've made two changes. And this is the way I like my desktop to look. Everybody has a particular way that they like their desk to look, a particular configuration. You know, I like my pencils over here, I like my brushes over here, I like my paints over here, so on and so forth. Okay. Well, we can go to Window. We can go to Workspace, and I can either go back to the default Workspace and it will reset it, or what I can do is I can save Workspace, and I'll name it Kirk's Workspace. 
Why? Because I can't. Okay? So now someone else comes in here and uses it, and they change it around. So they go to workspace, and they go to the fault workspace, and it changes it back. Well, that's not the way I want to work it. Maybe you have multiple ways that you like to lay out your, your desktop. Well, now I can come back to the, to the window, go to workspace, and you'll notice at the bottom it says Kurt's workspace. Now I select it, and it goes back to where I said it. So you can have multiple workspaces. And actually, in some programs back in here, they set it up under workspace that we can have basic, you know, legacy workspace. Um, let's go back to the default workspace. And in Illustrator, there's actually even more. You know, it's set up for typography, set up for whatever, you know, whatever we happen to be working on at the time. The other menus are pretty traditional, that when you go under the file menu, you know, traditional I mean it's, if you were using Microsoft Word, it wouldn't be much different. That here is where you create a new file, here's where you open existing files, if you want to browse files, if you want to save or close files or import, things like that. Later on though, when we get to editing images, we'll go under edit, there's one place. Um, image menu. Notice that all these are grayed out at the moment. And that's because we don't have an image open to edit. So none of our filters are available. None of our edit features are available. But as soon as we have an image open that's ready to edit, they will be available to us. If you wish to change preferences in Photoshop, that would be found under the Photoshop menu. When you go to preferences, and we can go to general. And for example, maybe you want to change the units or rulers. Right now, rulers are set to inches, but maybe I'm, getting more, I'm working on the web and I want to switch pixels because it's easier to measure items for the web than pixels since it's set up for monitors. Then I can do so. Type is typically measured in points. This is where you would change any number of features on the fly. And you can change them at any given time when you're working on a document. So let's go ahead and open a document. There's a number of ways that you can do that. One of the ways that I want to introduce to you to open, aside from going to the traditional file, either new, um, and this is something that I'll, I'll talk about at length on another day, is that when you're setting up a file and in one of my assignments, I might tell you, okay, the size of the document that you're going to use is going to be 4 by 6. Okay? So instead of pixels, we're going to measure in inches. And I want it to be 6 inches wide, and I want it to be 4 inches tall. And the resolution in this class is going to be extremely, extremely important because in this class, we are designing for print. And we're going to work from between 200 and 300 pixels per inch. If you do an entire project at 72 pixels per inch, it will be worthless for print. It will be wonderful for the web to email someone, but it will not have high enough resolution. There will be not enough content in there to be able to print out of How many of you have done that at home? You downloaded an image off the internet, and on the screen it looks cool. It's like, this is great, and you print it out, and you see all the ugly pixels. You go, why is that? That's because it's a low resolution image. And it's easy to muck up your your projects if you don't proceed with them in a, in a way that I will <coughs> strongly recommend because that is one area that I I am very forgiving the first project. When I see that happen in the last project, uh, an A project can go to a C project because it, it will totally ruin ruins it when you get that wrong. So I'm, but I'm setting up a new file and I can go ahead and want it to be high res, so 300 pixels per inch, and we'll call it text. This is our text file. <coughs> White background is fine, and I click OK, and voila. Now notice the size of the image. This looks bigger than, I mean, if, I, if you're looking at your number, this is bigger than 4 by 6, isn't it? That has to do with the resolution of the image. 
If we look in the lower left hand corner, we're only looking at this at 50%. And that's 50%. You're just saying that it looks bigger. And I look at this at 100%. So let's go ahead and, and um, increase the size of this. 100%, that just doesn't make sense. Well, the size of this pertains to screen resolution. And even though we're working at 300 pixels per inch, this is what it is at 100% at screen resolution. If I want to see how big this looks <coughs> when I'm ready to print, we can always go to view, and I can show down here print size. And now we can see, and that's a little bit more close to where it's going to be when it's going to print. Another safeguard to make sure that the size is right is to make sure that you have rulers visible. You have to have a file open to have rulers visible. To have rulers visible, the easiest way to remember it is R. R for rulers. Command capital is the command key. Command R. Command R for rulers. And if you forget that, it will be under view. And you'll see right here the rulers. That's another thing. When, when there are keyboard equivalents to whatever we're doing, if there are keyboard equivalents, they will be found to the right of whatever it is that you want to select. And you'll notice that the command with the little cloverleaf symbol and R are to the right of rulers. They try to make most of them, like when you want to open a file, command O for open. Man, S for say, things like that, but not all of those work that you run out of them for a while, and some of them don't quite do it. You can also, as I said, if we go ahead and we look at this, let me zoom out a little bit. So we do this. And I'm going to zoom in one more time. If you look at the size of the rulers, that looks pretty much on my monitor about the size of an inch. So I know that this is close to the 25%. It's close to the actual print size, even if I'm not sure. <clears throat> and if I zoom in here, like so, and I'm looking at this at 66.67%, or two thirds size, notice that the, the distance from um, between inches two to three has gotten much bigger. I know that that's not the size of an inch. So there's something else going on here that I need to check. So if you're not sure, go back to view and say, show print size. And that will give you a pretty good idea of what you're looking for. And then if you're not sure, again, well, that's supposed to be good, then go back to image and go to image size, and you will see, oh, OK, it's 300 pixels. Now, watch what happens when I change the resolution. And this is, it will allow you to do this. And there's, well, another, and on another day, I'll show you some no-nos and some gotchas and stuff. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change this to 72 pixels per inch. Okay? So the, the physical size is the same, document size. Width and height is the same, but now I've reduced the resolution. I'm throwing away pixels. Why do I want to do that? Because if I'm going to design for the web, you don't want a high-res image. It's just a little bit of a purpose, you know, designing for print. Now watch what happens at the end. It reduces in size, so it's still 24%, but when I look at it at 100%, now it's the same size as pretty much as what I had before. See how resolution is going to play an important factor in here? Really, really important. How things print, how they view, and all sorts of things. This will become really, really important. Um, the other thing that we can look at in the lower left hand corner, <clears throat> and it's up to you, is that when I click and I hold down the option key on here, I just click on the button here, um, I can say show, I can say document sizes, document profile, measurement scale, scrap sizes, efficiency timing, current tool, which is a waste, there's a lot of things that are useless. What is helpful is if you hold down the option key and you click on here, it will tell us the width and the height in pixels and inches, the number of channels, so this is an RGB file, and it will give us the resolution without having to go to image. It gives us a lot of really important information about our file that we're working on. Okay, so that's holding down the option key and clicking on it. Okay. 
So that's one way to start a brand new file, starting with a, a clean canvas, um, command N for new, put in, dial in the size and the resolution that you want, and you're set to go. A number of projects that we work on will be done that way. Um, it, it's just the way the commercial art world works, that when you're designing for a magazine ad, the magazine is, let's say it's eight and a half by 11, or it's nine by 12. Well, if you make it nine and a half by 13, that doesn't quite work. When you scale it, it's not gonna fit that format, so they're gonna have to crop it some way, and an art director could be really upset when they have to do that. That maybe it will crop out something that you put in there that was really important. You know, they didn't want left out. So exact sizes can be really, really critical. And it's easy to do, but it's easy to mess up. Okay. You know, the other way that I want to show you, aside from going to file open, um, let's do it both ways. I'm going to go to file open, and I'm going to find a sample file. I mean, I can find one on my desktop. Here's the late tip that I have on my desktop. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll open it. And boom. So that's an existing file. It opens it. Take a look. Nice. Another way to open files that we'll use and cover in a later exercise is the bridge, which is a very powerful, powerful tool. I click on here, and it's actually a separate program that launches. And you'll notice that Photoshop went away. On the bottom of my dock, I have BR for bridge, and it opens up, and look at what happens here. It's a whole separate file. Now, if I had a CD in here, or I had my camera pictures, or if I want to go into the computer, I click on the computer, and I double click, and let's go into applications. And I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to find Photoshop. And I'm going to find in Photoshop examples. <coughs> and you can see here, without even opening all of these pictures, here are all the samples of I have of this image. And notice that they show up here on the right. So I can enlarge this and I can view it. Oops, or I can scroll through all of these as well. There we go. Without having to open it, I can look at it. It's almost as big as I need to. Um, and that's really pretty nice. And there are also a number of other features that I have available to me in here, too. How many of you have taken the, um, is it just me or is it getting hot? Is it getting warm? Am I getting so? <laughs> Feel comfortable to you or? OK. Um, if any of you have used digital cameras, there is a ton of metadata built in for those images that you take. Um, there are some cameras that actually have GPS in them. So when you take a photograph, it knows exactly where in the world you are when you take it. And that is all built in to that image. It's really pretty astounding. If we look down here, you'll see two tabs. One is metadata, the other are keywords. If you are so inclined and you have the time and you're a very organized person, what you can do is that you can set up for each of the images that you download from your camera, or it doesn't have to be from your camera, but that's typically what people do. You can set up, like, okay, this event. Okay, events, and I want this to be birthdays. That's the category I want this photograph to be filed under. And under people, it was, you know, I want that to be the category too, another category. This was Matthew's birthday. Places, um, we took Matthew to New York for his birthday, so I'm going to put that there. And all of that metadata now is attached to that image. And then later on, when you want to do a search, you type in birthday for Matthew or New York, and it will be one of the images that pops up. You can also organize these by quality of, of image. So you can grade the images. You know, how many of you have taken a photography class where they told you to bracket your images? And you're supposed, you know, so you have maybe three images of the same thing. And you can determine, well, this is the best one, second, third, or they're all great, or none of these work at all. 
You can also delete files from here. Select it, hit the delete key, and it's gone permanently from your computer. So be careful. It's not just gone from the browser or the um, bridge. It's gone permanently. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if I did that at home on my home computer and I had all these pictures in there, would they all pop up on the bridge? Yep, they all pop up. You just, w when you go inside a folder, and there could be, see there's another folder in here. And until I double click on there, if there's, if there's something that it can't view, then it won't. So if you're only looking at you know, um, applications or you're only looking at folders, there's nothing for it to view. But if there is an image that's a readable by Photoshop, it will show up here. <clears throat> Look at the metadata over here. This tells you the size of the image in pixels. It's, um, so this is a high res digital image. 3,072 pixels by 2,048. It's a little over four megabytes, pretty good size. Um, DNG file, which is a type of um, digital image. Um, a type of raw file in particular. Um, we can look down here under the camera data. It tells us the focal length. It tells us the lens was an 85 millimeter lens tells us the dimensions, it gives us the bit depth. Um, all sorts of stuff. Probably more information than you want to know about this. And you can also put stuff in here. Who took the photograph? Who owns the copyrights? All that sort of thing. You can tag all of these images. Remember the thing that we saw on Monday? The guy that was talking about images taken from Flickr that are tagged with metadata? Well, what if they're tagged with all that data? That will enrich your image, and if it's used in a program like that, it will enrich the whole as well, adding all of that information in the background. So these are some of the things that you can do. If you want to view a couple of them at the same time, um, or a bunch of them, you can do that. I can click off of it, maybe I just want her. Um, maybe I want this one and this one. Or if I don't want this one, there are keystrokes I'm clicking on here in order to do that. Um, I want this one. I want this one. I want this one. Okay, so I'm going to open these three. So all I have to do is double click, and voila, they open. I can come back. <coughs> And I can either close it or I can put it away. Now I have these three images open in Photoshop. <coughs> and again, when you look at these, um, you'll be able to tell right away this is 33%, it's a 9 megabyte image. That's a pretty good size image. Look at the size of the, the ruler here. Let's go to image size. It's only 72 pixels per inch, but look at the width and the height. 28 inches by 21 inches. So now when I turn off resample, and it links the width and the height to the resolution, when I change this to 300, it's really only a 5x6 image. But maybe because it's taken with a digital camera, if I put in here 180, this is a raw file format. It's 8.5 by 11, that would be a pretty good size image, and it would probably come out pretty nice. I would not recommend doing that if you get off the internet. Okay. Um, let's especially when color is important to you. Or maybe you want to isolate the image and you don't want the clutter of all the other images and all the, the menus and stuff around you. <clears throat> well, we have down here this little icon. This is, we're currently in standard screen mode. If I look at maximum screen mode, it changes it. We only see the current selected image in gray and surrounding. So it's more neutral. And if color is critical, we can select something. 
um, a color that's probably really appropriate. We can also select here full screen mode, and that really reduces everything else. We can also switch to full, um, that was full screen mode with menu bar. This is full screen mode black. And if I hit the tab key, it puts away my tools, and I can see this totally isolated without clutter around it. Bring that back. Maybe if I want to see it in full screen mode, hit the tab key again, and now I'm seeing it with a gray background. And again, this is usually when color is important to you. So this will be important. Um, typically, the way this starts um, is I'm going to deviate from this a little bit more. They've covered some things, but they will cover more of this on a little bit. But I'm going to do some fun things for the moment to show you what can be done. Okay, so I'm going to go back to standard screen mode. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you that, and this happens often when you take programs and you use the automatic features. And if you're not careful, but, um, the way cameras are set up, that the selector that uh, is weighted to the background, when, it, when you point, it's not quite in the right place. It takes a beautiful picture of the background, but you can see that she's in shadow. And you figure, oh, gee, you know, I've, I've ruined the image. Well, there's lots of data built in here, lots and lots of data. So what I can do is I can go to edit, and it's on file, on the, probably isn't here either. Um, hold on one second, I screwed up. Let's go to image adjustments, shadow highlight. That's what it is. Now when you look at it, automatic settings look what it does. Pretty cool. Makes it much better. So the only thing that this cannot fix, and I want to emphasize that, and it's something that when you're working with photographs is that if the image is out of focus, it cannot put an image into focus. If it's out of focus, top. If it's in focus and you want to put it out of focus, it can do that real well. You know, so for example, if I were to take one of our nifty tools here, I'm waiting, I'm looking because I'm waiting for my video tape to run out here. Oh, question. You went out to right now, how did you do that? You went to, out to image? No, you don't have to do that. No, no I mean, um, how you fix the, the shadow? Oh, go to image adjustments and it's shadow highlight. Um, there's another nice feature too that I'll show you. When you scan multiple images on a flat bed scanner. Oh, sorry, one more. But if you redid that again, what would it do to the image? If you do it again, image adjustments, and we use shadow highlight, lightens per even further. It duplicates it. But there's ways to account for that. See how it's making this even minor. There are other tools that you can use, probably better when you go. This will also make some of her grainy too, that you have to watch out for. It adds um, some noise. Um, I hope that this file is still in here. Let me open it up. Let me go back to hard drive. I probably should just use the bridge. That would probably make it easier. See if it's still here. Taken all of your 
color, your, your photos and get them back from our photo place. And they're not digital images, so now you have to scan them. And you gain scan them, and you want them now to be, they're a little crooked. You want to be straightened, and you want them to be separate images again, right? So now what we can do, is we can go to File, and we Automate, and we can select Crop and Straighten Photos. And then in a couple of seconds, there we go. We have them all separate. And we have our original. Pretty cool, huh? It works well for solid colors in the background if it's not a solid color. It doesn't. So there's some incredibly powerful automated features in here that we'll be able to take advantage of. And we will go through these in a number of more exercises. Um, sometimes there are things that we like it to do, and I mentioned the focus that it can't do. Um, another thing that we can do too, which is pretty cool, let's go ahead and go file again. Let's open it. It is part of the same sample. And it is. Um, how many of you have ever. Let's look at this one. This one. This one. So I'm going to open all three of these. Where you wanted to take a panoramic view. So here's an image. <clears throat> here's another image. You know, and if, if you were to, to line them up, they would fit together into one, one image. But they don't. They're three separate images. So what I'm going to do, hopefully I can do this without making too many mistakes here, is I'm going to go to Photo, or File, Automate. And I want what I want to do is to photo, use photo merge. And I'm going to select from. I'm going to browse. And I'm going to come in here. I'm going to add these three files. And open them. And I don't want to add open files. I just want these. And now I go ahead and I click OK. So I'm working with files that aren't even open. And we see the different options that are available to us. I'm just going to leave it in auto mode and click OK. And it's going to go through. It's going to open them. And before you know it. And we'll stitch them all together. And it does a pretty good job of it. And it just crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so now is the time to turn off my video recorder. Hmm? Well, I have bridge. No, no, I just pretty much it. Probably had too much to open. Let me try it one more time.
So what is happening here, there are a number of actions, automated features that have been set into play. Now, you can see it stitched them all together. Now we can either crop this or we can do some other things in here to make this work. We can, yeah. No. That's what's amazing, that the algorithms that are, the programmers use I mean, um, there's a video that I will show from Linda.com where he does it, and they they really don't match. These were, you know, somebody put this on a tripod, and they matched pretty darn close. But these don't look like they match at all. And it's amazing when he does similar demonstration, what he does. And then we can come back and go to, you know, image. Um, uh, hold on. I'm going to use transform. And let's try, I'm going to try to store it and see if that will work. If I click here and pull that, pull this part down. Probably should have used another feature. But that's okay, just to give you an idea. And I'm, you know, tweaking a little bit. With people, you can't do this. But there are ways that you can fix this. If you don't want to crop, you know, we can go back in and let's, um, is that going anymore? Um, transform, I'm trying to remember which one I'm going to use. It's not distorted.